Um, so we are, uh, my name is Clement, and uh, I'm one of the founders and uh, chief architect of Wavefront. We also have Shujin, who actually did our uh, gRPC uh, to Avro migration. So that he's the guy that you want to ask questions about, you know, how, how do you actually go, because I think the original question was, how do you get from Avro being, you know, what is used, I guess, by Chris over here, storing data, probably doing, uh, actually not doing RPC, so not using Avro. How do you go from there to, to uh, transporting your payloads over Avro and not having to keep you know, two sets of uh, you know, portal files in, in Avro AV wallets, right? And uh, so very quickly, I'm just gonna uh, do a brief intro of Wavefront and also talk a little bit about our architecture, you know, we kind of why we needed all this kind of uh, you know, RPC stuff, right? So any, just a show of hands, like anybody knows uh, or used Wavefront before? Yay, cool. We have some Wavefront engineers here. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so feel free to ask, feel free to ask them about, uh, about Wavefront. Um, so I used to work at Google, so actually uh, I, I actually used Portal 1 uh, a long time ago, and still, yeah, so there's still position, there's still one thing. Is, is the number, if the tag number gets really large, is it still a problem, like performance-wise? It is still a problem. Okay, so, uh, so what, yeah, 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 so I remember like having to reserve uh, those tags, obviously Stubby, Katana, GSLV, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I loved about Google is Google has a really strong observability culture uh, really early on. You know, Borgmon was you know, how, we, how they monitor all that kind of uh, constant change and scaling and all that kind of stuff. And Wavefront is really a reaction to that. And um, we were acquired last year by VMware. And actually this morning we had uh, our annual R&D conference, which they shipped you know, a whole bunch of engineers, locked them up in, in Hilton, San Francisco, and you know, come out. You know, come out and you talk about blockchain and talk about you know all this kind of interesting stuff but it, it actually surprised me as to how how much easier observability these days are because i was talking to some of the vmware guys and they were talking about how do you actually figure out there is a l2 cache misfetch by you know 64 bytes in an intel processor and the only way to know is to look at core dumps and then you kind of call intel and they do some sort of logic analyzer and then they figure out, you know, they prove, you know, there's something wrong in the processor. I mean, there's just no other easy way to know there's something wrong in the processor except to, you know, go through all these, you know, staring at a core dumps for months, right? Nowadays, you know, with, with a lot of the stuff that we're, we're writing, certainly with gRPC, observability and monitoring is, is part of that whole story, right? And so one of the reasons why we started Wavefront was to basically give observability and monitoring as a service in the cloud with massive scale, a language that allows you to manipulate time series, histograms, uh, distributed tracing, and all that kind of stuff, and have a front end that actually, somebody is, uh, uh, and have a front end that's actually nice, you know, that you could interact with, you know, creating alerts, integrate, you know, get, uh, pulling metrics from clouds, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, very quickly, let me make sure I have, oh, that's the agenda. So, so very quickly, just talk about uh, Wavefront. So, the, the idea is we're going to, you know, give you spiffy charts and we'll give you intelligent alerts. And uh, we have a couple of uh, really interesting companies that are using Wavefront at scale today. I, I think Envoy was mentioned today. Lyft actually sends all of their time series data to, to Wavefront. And so Envoy, all of that metrics that, that comes out of there actually gets shipped into, uh, into Wavefront. And so I talked to Matt quite a bit just to see how, you know, they, they monitor all of the microservices, all their RPC calls and whatnot, latencies and whatnot, right? And, uh, uh, one thing to mention is I think you guys were using uh, Drop Wizard, which actually came out of a project in uh, Yammer. And actually, Yammer, you know, when when, it, when they ship metrics from Drop Wizard, which is now Code of Hell, took it kind of a, as an open source uh, project now. Yammer actually still sends all of their metrics uh, today into Wavefront. So we're kind of this uh, cloud-based uh, telemetry store. And one of the reasons all of these companies use Wavefront is because they probably tried something that's uh, maybe Prometheus, InfluxDB, or OpenTSDB, and they ran into some sort of scaling issue that, you know, that there's some cliff where it doesn't scale anymore. And so they, they go to Wavefront because we're one of the only solutions that takes in millions of data points per second. So we're able to just gather and suck up all of the time series data, index it, and have query language that allows you to manipulate it in a very quick way. So there are a couple of design decisions as we you know, embarked on this journey kind of five years ago. So as I mentioned, it needs to be massively scalable. We need to be able to take all of that data from you know, kind of a fire hose. And so one of the examples that we have, Box is one of our customers. The ingress network traffic that, we've, that we get from Box is about two gigabits per second. So there's, you know, that's how much data that they're sending in from as metrics from their data center to us. 
And one of the interesting learnings that I had actually uh, from Google is Google search is, has a really fast response time, right? Their P99, I, I believe is 100 milliseconds. So that's really what you want to be at for someone to feel, you know, it's kind of blink of the eye, you can refine queries and whatnot, right? So one of the goals is to ha build an analytic service that's able to not do at P99, but our median latency is less than 100 milliseconds. So kind of the, the average experience that you, that you do queries, you, because you're firefighting, you're trying to figure out some, whether something's wrong, you're trying to get a number as to you know, maybe forecasting your capacity, you're trying to figure out is my code that got deployed, is it working, is it crashing, how many people are using my feature, all of those are metrics data, right? And you want it to be able to get you know, information very quickly. And so we tried to design the system so that it would be, it would be fast, so you're not crunching, you're not doing math abuse, let's say, and you're able to get an answer very quickly. And then finally, high availability. So a lot of our, our uh, customers rely on us. Uh, Lyft actually has all of their ride data in Wayfront. So you could actually pull up in San Francisco how many people are waiting for rides, how long are rides taking, you know, how many drivers are available, how many of them are you know, off, meaning taking somebody on, on a journey. And all of that is, is sent to Wayfront so that they know if there's something wrong or maybe because of delete Uber that they you know, could suddenly get a surge in, in, in requests and whatnot and that they actually could react accordingly. And one of the important parts is that the monitoring system needs to have higher availability than their service, right? And so a lot of our companies that we service, they actually have really high uptime guarantees already to their customers, and they hold us at an even higher uh, bar because uh, one of our customers basically just said if Wavefront is not available or if there's any delay in the metrics pipeline, then all of their release needs to stop because they, they're just flying blind and they don't, they don't want to roll any software when that happens, right? So, there are three of the pillars of, of how we approached, I would say, uh, architecture. So I think five years ago is, is kind of when we decided, you know, uh, how do you actually build software five years ago? And there wasn't, I don't think there was gRPC at that point. I think Drop Wizard was uh, still kind of a Yammer project. AWS obviously is all the rage, you should go to the cloud. And um, we were very close to actually writing in J2EE and thankfully not. So we were actually uh, at least wrote it in Java J2SE. Um, but we at least chose a kind of a microservice architecture. So this is a very, very simple diagram of how it, how it works. So today, uh, we actually split up the engine in, into multiple pieces already. And all of those are, are just services that are both handling API calls. So kind of drop wizard, uh, Jersey mapped uh, uh, call sites, as well as uh, today, we are actually fully gRPC, but Avro over gRPC. So if you rewind about a month and also you know, since the beginning of our company, it was Avro over IPC. So between these uh, services, they were just making uh, these kind of uh, RPC calls that are serialized in binary form. And because of, you know, as I said, it's two gigabits per second coming in from, from the pipe, you don't want to JSON that, right? You don't want to like, then serialize it in JSON and, and having to transport all of that inside your network. So we try to you know, really compress those uh, into as, as small of a payload as possible. And uh, AWS also makes you do strange things, like you, because it's like they, they charge every like nickel and dime, every call and every bits that you're sending. So you try to make sure that you're you make the least number of requests and, and whatnot. So we have a lot of uh, experience on, on doing uh, things like that. So a little bit of, of background as to how we kind of designed the service. So we started with uh, Drop Wizard. We started with uh, uh, Avro IPC. And some of the questions uh, actually came up today is how, how do you actually do service registry, right? So early on, we decided that it's not gonna be DNS because we're actually be gonna run multiple services on the same box. So there would be port collisions, right? So one of the things that we did is we're just gonna mount services on random ports, just you know, bound, bound to port zero, right? And we actually use Foundation DB. Uh, it's now open sourced by Apple and um, Woohoo. So everybody could use that. And so we actually have a single storage system where it is both transactional, it's both a key value store, and it also acts like a zookeeper. So you could actually do things like leader election, you could do service discovery and all the kind of stuff on a single uh, layer. So what we did is whenever a service comes up, it would actually register itself into FDB and said, I am X service, I'm on this IP on this port. So I could actually run 10 copies of the same service on the same box and, and it, would, it would work. We didn't use uh, containers back then. And uh, so that registry allowed us to basically build what is uh, pre in the previous presentation termed a client proxy. Right, so you would actually then just you know, probe FDB, and because it's like Zookeeper, it will give you callbacks. If there is a new node that end joined, and if there's a node that left, we would then be able to figure out, okay, we need to make a new TCP connection, and uh, nowadays in gRPC, make a new channel, I suppose, to, the, to, a, to another backend. 
And uh, with a client proxy, there are some benefits. I think that was listed there. You know, obviously you don't have to go through a sidecar. You don't have to go through Envoy. But it also means you could do interesting things that perhaps uh, today, or at least or as, as far as I know, is not even uh, in Envoy yet. For example, we could do simulated multicast. So if you want to talk to all the backends of a single service, you could actually, you know, query for that and just make the, the call. Obviously, there's no guarantee that, you know, uh, you would get a response for all of those, but it will just try to make the call across all known backend services. You could actually also encode then have annotations on the IDL that says, is this an idempotent service? And the RPC call itself could figure out, I mean, the stub itself could figure out, should we retry and, and what is the backup strategy? How many times are we trying? All that kind of stuff. And I think one of the questions asking about sharding, uh, we actually do that. So we actually can examine the, the actual uh, request parameter in Avro. Avro is not a single message payload, so it actually has arguments on the RPC call for those who have tried it. Um, so you could actually make that call and figure out, okay, I need to actually talk to a specific backend for that using some sort of consistent hashing model and, and whatnot. So we actually uh, implemented all of that. So that's, uh, that's kind of our framework for uh, doing a service registry, essentially. And we actually have Nginx in front, and we actually rewrite the Nginx configs based on that change. So we're actually restarting uh, Nginx, which, which is now becoming an issue because Keep Alive and all that kind of stuff is, uh, when you restart Nginx, it's not like Envoy where it actually terminates all the workers. I don't know if you use Nginx before. It terminates all the workers, so all the Keep Alive needs to end, and so the client would actually see a, an actual connection uh, broken message, and you have to have your, your established connection, connectivity and whatnot. But we kind of maintain that structure all along. So it's client, uh, proxy that's actually you know having its lo own local load balancer. We actually implemented a least connection uh, policy, but obviously it's least connection from the perspective of, of that particular process. And uh, and then we have Nginx, which basically you know look at all the HTTP routes that are that are you know in injected into the uh, service registry and mounts all of those. So it, the Nginx would actually the Nginx uh, machine would actually know which backend to hit based on what HTTP route that it's actually seeing. So that's kind of how we implemented the, uh, the whole service mesh and uh, service registry component of that. Speaking of Arrow, Arrow, um, uh, I think you guys, uh, some of the folks at WePay actually uh, use Arrow. And uh, so we, we picked Arrow, um, well, not that I, I don't like protos, but I think Arrow was one of those uh, standards out there where, you know, if you're on HBase, if you're doing, kind of storing any kind of data structure, maybe on Kafka or um, yeah, on HBase, you will probably pick uh, Avro because that's kind of what Apache itself uh, would recommend and it has all, all kinds of nice schema evolution features. I think Avro 1.9 is going to be released soon, which will have the Avro over gRPC code that we, uh, that we gave to, we donated to Apache. And um, it will also have uh, in 1.9, I think enum evolution. So you actually could go back and forth uh, by mapping default values and you know, all that kind of stuff back and forth. I think that's one of those uh, strengths in, in Avro is that kind of schema evolution. And that's, there's no prescribed direction almost in terms of uh, schema evolution. You could just hop back and forth. As long as you know the schema, you could write it in, in the form. You could read it first, and you could write it back in a, in a different format. I think that's, that's one of the strengths that it has. So one of the difficulties with that is that you need to have the actual schema before you could actually do stuff, right? So you always have the right schema because that's compiled into code, right? That's the code gen part that took care of that, right? But you're, when you're reading code, then you're, you're reading some blob and you need to figure out how to actually interpret that. And so what we actually Im implemented is a schema registry. So actually all the, uh, we hash the, uh, it, no, uh, actually no, we actually have a version. So we actually allocate a version ID for the actual Avro schema and we store that with the payload. And when we actually pick up a record, we would then say, okay, this is using, you know, Avro schema three, right? And it pulls up from, from, the, uh, from our FDB store and then it knows how to read it. And then and basically we can evolve schema that way, right? You could always read a newer, uh, uh, you could re always read an older proto, oh, sorry, an older Avro payload and write it out uh, in your newer version, but it also allows old code to read new stuff that was written. So that was an important part when you're rolling back you could actually, the old code could actually pick up the schema that was written by, let's say you did a rollback, right? So you, some of the payloads were actually written in the new schema format. You could actually read that and then evolve it backwards, right? So fields that don't get understood will get dropped. If your enums have default values and it will map to the default, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? You, you could even remove a field and go backwards and have that field reappear as long as it has default values that are, that are specified in, in, in Avro. So that's, 
that's kind of what we uh, what we ended up with. And obviously, all of that is cached heavily in, in, in the system, so that when it comes up, it will have all of that information uh, uh, read from from FDB and be able to decode basically any payload that you have. One of the interesting things that is actually not currently in Avro uh, gRPC, which I think it's a future work, is Avro actually implements a schema evolution on the RPC level as well. So the first handshake it does is actually sends the, the read-write schema. So you could actually have the client uh, understand what the server would understand or the server understands what the client would be coming in as and still have the ability to evolve the, the protocol, uh, the, the, the wire format. I think that's important because when you're doing microservices, a lot of the time you're probably you know, doing canaries, you're having mixed serving kind of scenarios, and you have to make sure that you, you know, during that kind of rollout, you don't have a whole bunch of you know, illegal, you know, whatever, cannot understand payload or that kind of exceptions that are happening. So that evolution of schema is not just for kind of static uh, stored entities, but also for, you know, RPC calls. And as I said, it, that's, that bit is in Avro IPC, which is kind of the Avro own, Avro's own version of uh, RPC framework, which is based on NetE3X in Java. But uh, that's not in the uh, Avro gRPC framework that we're shipping today. But, uh, but hopefully at some point, you know, we will have that as well uh, in the system. So I'm just going to end with uh, this slide just to give an idea of basically how the entire uh, kind of wavefront system works. And this is just a, not an entire, this is just a glimpse of how it actually works. So we obviously have a whole bunch of uh, front-end UIs that's actually talking HTTP or HTTP2, so an Nginx uh, system that I mentioned. And so they have a whole bunch of microservices that are underneath there. They're all drop wizard services and they all implement, you know, HTTP. They all register into the service registry. Nginx decides how to route traffic. And all of them also register their RPC services into a single service registry and have all of that being available so that in this particular example, if you have a learning service that needs to talk to, uh, well, it has a huge load. So if you have a learning service and it has, actually has to talk to, let's say, Painter in this case, it would be able to you know, talk to the registry and figure out, okay, I need some way to get a hold of a Painter. I don't care how you give it to me, but it just gives you a, a Java stub that allows you to touch it. Right? So we have a couple of uh, kind of these functional domain services. We're just libraries uh, under Wavefront. And so we have a microservice framework and underneath it is, is kind of what I, I touched on, which is the, uh, the service server framework and the service client framework. So the server framework uh, does all these registrations into, uh, into our storage system, which happens to be FDB. And the service client framework is what is uh, doing the client proxy uh, load balancing and whatnot. So that's, uh, and ultimately they're using uh, Netty, they're using Drop Wizard, they're using Apache Avro. And so the journey that uh, I think we took very recently and the reason why you know, I got introduced to Chris was I was thinking, you know, how do we make sure that we are kind of evolving with times? And you know, Netty 3X is, is end of life and uh, Avro IPC is still, still using uh, Netty 3 and there are known bugs there that Netty has basically decided not to fix. And so we decided, you know, what else do we want to go to? Do we want to actually, actually shed our own service client framework and use Envoy or Istio if we go to containers? And that was one of the discussions that we had. And we said, okay, well, let's actually first look at whether we could transport over gRPC. Because if we could do that, then that opens up a whole bunch of doors. And that was the initial gist of why um, uh, Shujin started looking into whether it's possible to plug in a different serialization framework uh, into uh, into our into uh, gRPC, and that's uh, kind of the work that we will talk to you about. With that I will hand over to uh, to Shujin. Thank you, Clement, uh, for the introduction. Actually, some of my slides will overlap uh, on what he has already touched about. Okay, so I guess that you guys are already using Avro. I is there anyone of you who uses like for Avro for RPC as well, apart from the serialization? Okay. So a quick refresher about uh, what is Apache Avro. It's a data serialization framework, much like Protobuf or Thrift, and it serializes to compact binary format. It has, it provides uh, RPC and has its own interface definition language. You can define the schemas in a JSON or in an IDL. Here you see an example, same example as the book. Uh, an address book where uh, address book service where you have like the phone phone type with the enum and the record 
So this is how you define the schema in an app browser list. And if you if you are using the RPC as well, that's how at the bottom you see like the methods that you use to create a person, all the CRUD operations basically. So this. And why would you use Avro? So Avro is the min, my, similar to Protobuf and Thrift, but different in the fact that uh, it does not actually encode the type information and the tag, it does not have any tagging information about the types into the actual serialized encoded data, but it requires the write, the schema with which you are written. So as it sees the fields in the schema, it just writes them out to the in their binary format and at the read time, you you require the write schema and then the reader scheme, read schema that you are using for the target value, and it looks at the field names actually to resolve the fields instead of the tag IDs like in Protobuf. So you definitely require the writer schema, and typically you would have when you are using Avro, you would store the schema as a header in a file if you are writing it to a file like in Hadoop, like where you have lots of records and you just write it at the header or the schema at the header and then append all the records or else you would use the schema registry like we did and have a hash on the record. So you can think of it like uh, basically protobuf has uh, at the field level, at the tag level, all the information and uh, for Avro you have the schema information like at, at a hash at the, for the total schema and have store the schema in, in some other place. So how is we, we are using we are using Avro for our uh, entity storage. So all of our entity data is stored into our key value data store uh, by serializing the Avro payload into that value. And we also, like Clement mentioned, we also use it for our uh, into backend service communication. And we have all Java services, and we are using Avro or Netty, which is like a TCP-based protocol. Uh, it actually it has like a quite a lot of languages. Uh, I I know that they have like C C plus plus C sharp Python Ruby, yeah, PHP. They don't have Go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so like I was mentioning, where would you use Avro? Like typically you'd see it being used in Hadoop, like where you have large file and store it at the header and have the records, and also you'd see it being used in the data pipeline, like Kafka, like Swift is using it. And also, it's also used for RPC inside Apache Plume, which came from Cloudera, and probably because like Avro is also something that came from Cloudera. Yeah, and also a few others. So given that Avro is like pretty good, like with all this uh, schema evolution and being able to store it in the data pipeline and commonly used in the Java world and Hadoop world, we, the reason we want to move to gRPC is that uh, it has HTTP2 and streaming, which is not present in GRP, Avro, Avro IPC, and also being having being standardized or HTTP2 instead of like a TCP protocol enables us to have service mesh and also get the latest for Java folks, like get the latest native 4.x instead of the 3.x, which has been UL, and also GRPC is fast moving. And then to get to GRPC. <laughs> How do we do that? <laughs> like one of the question that uh, Chris was asking is, since Protobuf is the default serialization for gRPC, do we still use Avro at the entity storage and then Protobuf at the RPC level? Then that means like lot of schema management. We thought the same. And also given that we were already on Avro IPC, that would mean that we would have to rewrite all of our stuffs and replace all of our code. Then we thought that, okay, why not replace uh, why not use Avro's IDL on top of gRPC? Like, why not replace the serialization framework of Avro with gRPC? And then I looked around and I saw that, okay, gRPC's APIs are actually very permissive in terms of being able to use a different serialization framework. And I saw one of the examples, which I think Vijay uh, did with an intern project, like with Thrift. Yeah, yeah. So. The trip, but the problem here was uh, we not only needed to replace the serialization framework for with Avro, but also we needed to support the Avro's ideal. So we, we decided that we would go with defining, since we already have schemas defined in Avro, we would define the RPCs also in Avro's ideal. So we would have to support the Avro's ideal way of doing the stubs and the schemas. So, and then we looked at what is the difference between the protobuf, which, which gRPC's APIs are closely aligned to, and then what is the difference between Avro? So you see like uh, 
one way rpc is one of the main things that was different like where in avro you have like a fire and forget mechanism where you can send the request and not have it but that's not there in grpc apis or in protobuf and de defining typed exceptions so the while you can have this uh, have like a record as an error and uh, define that uh, for the in the rpc itself but that's not there and having multiple request arguments and we would have to handle this at our stub so that it wraps up all of this and into single payload and then we would also have to deal with the fact that there are no streaming keywords in avro which we have to get it added so right now we are working around it by, by using like annotations in java you can have write an annotation into the avro idl and have it uh, be inspected so then we build this library which bridges most of the gaps that i mentioned in terms of the pre in the previous slide in terms of the ideal and also switches the serialization from protobuf to avro so most of the most of the serialization logic itself it's actually borrowed from the avro's ipc framework so which is why also we were using they so when an error occurs since we have a way to define exceptions over the wire when an error occurs it actually encodes it back into the response but then we saw that okay if we do this uh, grpc will not be able to get the error metrics so it would look like oh, it's a success response all the time so we, we are looking to change it to a uh, grpc status and have it have the actual exception encoded as a debug info inside this and so with with our library if you are on avro ipc framework what you need all you need to do is like uh, set up the grpc channels and servers and register the existing stubs that you have which are generated with like avro ipc and the protocol and you don't need to change any schema you don't need to introduce rewrite any of your implemented code or the stubs so since we are a monitoring company when we deployed grpc we wanted to observe what's going on what's ha what's happening in terms of the performance with grpc and this is our typical infrastructure so we use our own product to monitor all of our services and this is uh, the typical pipeline that you would see how we monitor our services since we said we, we use java services and you guys also use the drop wizard and on a java service backend service you have this grpc which is running and we have the listeners to that for all the metrics on to drop wizard metrics which which sends the metrics on to the drop wizard regist registry and from that we pull it out to a local agent which is running on the host which ships the data back to the wavefront cloud and you'll be able to like visualize and alert on that data i would like to do a quick demo of what our uh, dashboard looks like So this is our dashboard that we are using to you are seeing the live data here from our cluster from one of our internal cluster so these are some of the metrics that are coming in from the grpc services you can see like the client latency and the server latency you can see different instances that's popping up here which are making calls to that particular service and you can see the in flight rpc requests and request per server and some of the other things that we look at is the request and response p99 sizes so we batch a lot and we want to keep an idea on what the batching size is like and are there any thread pools on the grpc thread pool grpc executors that we are using are there any errors and also you'll see that uh, all of these metrics are like grouped by uh, service so with within wavefront like they come in from the individual host we have this ability within wavefront's time series language to be able to aggregate them by host or by service so since we moved from like uh, avro avro ipc and we are using like a different serialization on top of grpc and then there is like protobuf we wanted to know what the performance metrics look like and between all of this framework then we went ahead and looked at the grpc's benchmarks what what do they do closed loop benchmarks which where one call is initiated on top of another and you could have like a high high contention scenario and low contention scenario and since we changed like the serialization framework itself we wanted to play around a bit with the message sizes and we tested all of this on the aws cloud environment let's take a look at what the results look like okay on closed loop low contention scenarios that is like one channel one rpc what we saw is the 
that Avro actually performed better for smaller message sizes for less than 10 KB, where which probably because uh, Avro is like a pure TCP protocol where you just send the message and there is no overhead of establishing the connection. But that uh, benefits started to wane once you go to higher message sizes like 100 KB and one megabyte. Avro becomes quite slower, like by 30 percent or 40 percent. And in between, like using Avro or gRPC versus Protobuf or gRPC, what we saw is that Protobuf, Avro or gRPC is like slower than slower by around 10 percent compared to Protobuf or gRPC. This is probably because we are not really sure exactly where this latency is coming from, which we thought like there were some tricks that Protobuf is doing where it has a way to know the serialized message size ahead of it. But Carl just told me that uh, it's actually a source of latency with them. And yeah, we have to look into what's the difference here. And in high contention scenarios, like where there is like eight channels and 100 RPCs per channel, Avro is like consistently slower across the board versus Pro gRPC with Av Protobuf or gRPC with Avro. And the same thing continues for uh, Avro or gRPC, like it's slower by 10%, but it still keeps up with uh, Protobuf or gRPC. There isn't much difference in terms of performance. And also you'll notice that for 10 KB message sizes, I don't have values for Avro IPC. That's because it doesn't run for that scenario. They run into a bug. It always, uh, an exception surfaces where uh, Netty3.x basically said that since it's EOL, they are not going to fix it. So, which is a good thing why we moved to gRPC. And some of the learnings with uh, gRPC. So, Netty, gRPC Java specifically. Uh, since Netty is the preferred transport for gRPC Java, it Netty uses uh, Netty four. It uses Netty four dot x underneath, and Netty's four dot x has byte buff, which uses a lot of direct memory. So you have to be careful to monitor your services for the total process memory instead of the heap memory. This was something which we noticed in our production environment. And since it does its own memory management using unsafe operations, so you have to watch out for memory leaks. You usually wouldn't come across this. We encountered this because we were like. Uh, playing around with, our, with the serialization framework itself, like how we plug into the gRPC layer. You, it's quite stable otherwise. So, and also be sure to choose the right thread pool sizes for Netty's thread pools, default work well. And you, you also should be cautious to choose the right application uh, thread pool. So once the network connection completes, like the data read and all the processing is complete, it hands over to the application thread pool and uh, default is the cache thread pool choose whatever works best for you and also another thing that we noticed in production is that once we deployed we saw that we get, we got all these errors that okay the message size is over the payload then we realized that okay grpc has a default message size limit of four megabytes and we were above that and we needed to configure it and also use deadlines for clients if you are now, if you are making a blocking call on the client, make sure you use a deadline on the gRPC call so that it cleans up underneath and you are not stuck waiting for it. And one of the things we saw is like with the one-way calls on the one-way calls on our Avro RPC, it's like fire and forget since it, it used to return. But uh, we were doing slight, slightly something different on the gRPC layer where uh, we actually make the call on the server handler. It responds back with the null response and then invokes the server. Still, we are doing this round trip. If the response never came back to the client, so it would be stuck waiting for it. So using deadlines helps us in that scenario. Yeah. And the ongoing work. So add get the streaming keywords onto the Avro's ideal language and also have the RPC schema evolution support, like Clement mentioned before, like Avro has Avro IPC has a handshake mechanism where you exchange the schema at the beginning. So you can amortize the cost over the RPCs which we don't have, which we are planning to implement in the average RPC module that we have. And also we are looking for volunteers to implement this in other languages for Avro. <laughs> and that's it. We'll open up for the Q&A with that. Thank you for coming. Yes. So actually for the interest of the charts, I didn't include this once. I, we have tested like with 10 megabytes and 100 megabytes and whatever the same thing, like Avro is lower by 20% and 
protobuf these kind of abro abro uh, grpc is like 5 to 10% off versus protobuf or grpc that's the standard pattern that we saw yeah So, uh, so that's heavily cached, I kind of mentioned. So the first thing that you do you, you, when you read a payload is to figure out the schema ID. Then if you don't have it in memory, then you fetch it from, yeah. yeah. So you could do a TPL on that. Yeah, that's, that's on top of uh, FDB that we have. But I, I would assume you could use anything like my, even MySQL and you could, you could store it there. Also, one of the good things with Avro, like we heard in the previous talk, like how do you manage protos and how do you make sure it works? Well, with Avro, you always need the schema, like the schema with which you have written. So it guarantees, in a way, it guarantees that uh, you manage the schema as well and you use something like schema registry so that it's self-describing. You always have the schema info with, along with it tagged. So you have the historic info of how your schema has evolved as well. They can, yeah. I think Clement. So I think very early on, we did have Avril IPC. So once once the traffic actually ends up in Wavefront uh, over HTTP JSON RESTful calls, then it actually switches to Avro IPC. So we really switch from Avro IPC to Avro over gRPC. Yeah. So I think the there's a little bit of a, a difference there. So you in in your particular example, I would assume you would not be using the same annotated POJOs, right? You would actually have to convert those POJOs into either Avro or or if you already have those Avro entities then you would actually be transporting them directly uh, via your own schema. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We are actually looking to use the open tracing implementation that is there on the ecosystem, GRPC ecosystem. If not, if that doesn't work out well, then we are we were actually thinking of implementing our own interceptors. But even with interceptors, what we find is that you still have to pass it to every channel that you build. Like we want it, we want it to something we want it to be something less intrusive, like so that you can just drop it down like uh, five lines of code in your project at once. But I don't know how, we haven't fully looked at uh, how feasible Even Envoy right now, it requires like the application to propagate the tracing context. Something we were looking into is like, uh, if you are doing a gRPC call from a gRPC call, how do you propagate the context for that as well? Yeah. Any questions? I was going to make, it, make is uh, some of the charts that he showed in the actual product, uh, meaning the gRPC charts itself. If you happen to, we are looking to find volunteers who, you know, who want to be able to test that. And at some point, we'll basically be shipping those dashboards. So you could uh, essentially, you know, you could plug in the, actually, you don't even have to use Avro as long as you use gRPC. And uh, on Java, then you'd actually ship all of those metrics. And we have those kind of pre-canned dashboards that allows you to basically explore you know, what those metrics are. And... Uh,
थैंक यू